All right. Good evening, men of refuge and, and your guests, uh, some ladies perhaps, uh, which are whom are very welcome. We're going to uh, commence right away with some prayer, and uh, then Vic and Mike are going to lead us in some worship, and then we'll jump in from there uh, to our Bible study, which tonight will be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Last week, uh, Marty took us through chapter 1. Great study. Uh, tonight, just the first mm, 12 verses of uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, so that's where we'll be uh, shortly, um, after some prayer, after peanut butter, cookies, and coffee, and worship, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump in. So let's, uh, let's pray. We'll bring to the Lord some of the um, requests that, that I know typically our, our, our brothers on Thursday night would bring uh, to the table uh, as we always begin with the time of, of prayer requests, the guys turning in on, on the prayer slips, uh, just burdens on their heart, praise reports as well. Uh, and so we bring those, and um, we'll do that now, and, and whatever else the Lord puts in my heart, on your heart, you be praying as well, along with me, and, and on, on top of the things I'm praying. And then one other uh, item, by way of reminder, <clears throat> the Fireside Chats every Monday through Friday at noon, tomorrow is communion. Every Friday we'll be doing communion. Uh, so Pastor Bill will be uh, leading in communion. I think Joy will be uh, joining him in that. So have some elements ready by noon uh, tomorrow and pray with me now if you would. All right. Father, thank you uh, for this night, Lord, um, for this place and the various places that uh, folks from refuge are tuning in from, Lord, wherever that may be. And Lord, my prayer uh, for, for them uh, and my brothers here in the sanctuary uh, is your blessing, Lord, your gracious, unmerited favor, Lord, that you would just pour it out uh, on my brothers and their friends and their family, those they are with, uh, Lord, their spheres of influence, God, just grace them uh, abundantly, uh, Lord, especially mindful of those that are affected economically, uh, Lord, perhaps uh, the, ultimately the greater crisis um, here, and um, it can be devastating uh, for many whose uh, job is just pretty much eliminated right now. So Father, we pray that you would surprise them with open doors, um, Lord, that you would amaze them, Lord, that there would be just a, another testimony of how you showed yourself strong and mighty uh, despite circumstances, despite the odds, despite what's going on, Lord, that you would um, provide that uh, for those that have that particular need. And praise reports go right along with that, Lord, just hearing from uh, Brother Mike right moments ago uh, of your blessing on his business, Lord, and, and he being um, just part of that, that large contingent of self-employed folks from refuge. Lord, thank you for that praise report. And uh, Lord, asking you to to do that for, for others that are self-employed and um, just need at this time, and always for sure, but just needing um, your, your gracious hand upon uh, their businesses, Lord, that they desire to do as unto you, Father. So thank you for their testimony, and, and Lord, please continue to, to add unto them. Father, thank you for the praise report of our brother Ed, uh, who um, is out of the hospital and did not end up having... Uh, COVID-19 still had some serious ailments, but is on the road to recovery, and uh, Lord, a lot, of, a lot of brothers rejoicing uh, with our brother Ed, so thank you, Father, for that. Lord, also, uh, thinking of Ed, knowing that Ed would be wanting us, uh, especially Thursday night group of guys, to be praying for our veterans and the active military, Lord, um, servants uh, in, in a very real sense, uh, serving us as a country and um, sacrificing, Lord, so many. Uh, thinking of, of John uh, from our, our refu refuge family, um, deployed overseas until November, um, taking a, a pay cut to serve his country as a reserve. Lord, please, please provide for that family. And Lord, and not just in the monetary sense, but just um, those areas that, that affect a family when, when a husband, when a dad is, is away. Uh, for an extended period of time. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you'd fill in those gaps for families like that, Lord, not just uh, John and his family, uh, with Natalie and the kids, but, Lord, many families like them. 
So Lord, please just pour out your grace on them. Father, we pray too uh, for, for wisdom, um, for leadership. Lord, it's a prayer that we prayed a lot. I'm sure a lot of us individually pray that and, and we do it corporately and, and we'll continue to do that, Lord. It's, it's a great need uh, for people in positions of authority, decision makers uh, that are working to, to remedy this huge, huge crisis. Lord, they need wisdom from you, Lord, to sort through all of this. Uh, in a way that, that's right and effective. And so, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, we pray uh, for selfish motives to be exposed and, and just repented of. Lord, we pray for the kind of wisdom that is, is good, not just for one or a few, but for all, Lord. And Father, we pray for continued wisdom uh, on the economic front and the physiological front, Lord, on, on just uh, finding uh, quick cures and quick methods uh, of testing and resulting, and, and, and Lord, for health and recovery, Father. We pray for that, God. And Lord, we do so um, with a, a confidence, Lord, a confidence in you, just resting in you. You're our Father. Uh, you are our refuge, Lord. You are our strength, Lord. <laughs> Apart from you, uh, as your son said, we really can't do anything. So we look to you, we rest in you, and we praise you now with song, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Well, we're in Second Thessalonians, quite frankly, and we're in chapter 2. So <clears throat> if you haven't turned there yet, this would be a great time to do so. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. Um, we all know that there's, there's great wisdom, great need, it, it's essential to have written records, right, uh, of, of a variety of, of things in, in different arenas from, you know, a, a deal to, to you know, to, to purchase or sell. Um, we had just thanked the Lord in, in prayer moments ago for uh, Brother Mike, self-employed and specifically real estate. Closing a deal today amidst the times. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lots of paperwork in that, but it, it's needful. It's essential, right? When you're buying anything, not just a home, selling as well, details that, that can be checked on, that can be verified. This is what we said. This is what's included. This is what's not included and such. Um, words of a speech. That's really essential, right? You know, people say, well, you know, the, the president said such and such. It's like, uh, I'm not sure he really said it like that. Then you go back and you look at the written record. Oh, okay, it wasn't quite like that. Um, and so fact checks with facts, checking facts. Um, courtroom, right? In, in a courtroom, you we have a court reporter who transcribes all that takes place uh, in the courtroom in terms of, of, of the dialogue and such, evidence that's presented, and accusations and the defense and, and all. And it's recorded. It's, it's essential to, to have that. And, and, and that, that just the, the written record um, is important. And so in light of that, that reality that you and I are familiar with, I'm so thankful how God has uh, amazingly uh, preserved uh, his word, how it's survived millennia, right? Thousands of years. Uh, when we go to, to Israel on our trips, um, every year now, a hiking tour, alternating by the traditional tour, um, we, we make a point of, of going to the, the Qumran community uh, there by the Dead Sea, uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were found. Um, and in, the, in the, the earlier part of the 1900s, and um, it, it's such an important part uh, more, more than just a typical archaeological find, um, it, it's very significant. That's why it was a blessing for, for many years we had on display here on the stage um, some uh, very accurate and, and authorized copies of those Dead Sea Scrolls, a passage from Isaiah and, and some of the uh, uh, minor prophets that we were blessed with those by Scott Moffat and his family. But the, the significance of that is, and here's the point I was getting to, the Dead Sea Scrolls, is that when they looked at these scrolls of the various books from the Bible, Isaiah being one of those in some of the Psalms, that they found in the 1900s, these were 
uh, transcribed these scrolls from thousands of years prior to their finding. And when they looked at those, they found that, my goodness, this, this is exactly what we have in our Bibles. Which is, you may say, well, of course, but the reality is that, that any other document that you find that's, that's a couple thousand years old, not a couple hundred years, but a couple thousands of years old, um, th- that just is not the norm. That just typically does not happen. Uh, and so it, it encourages us, you know, with the accuracy of, of Scripture, uh, because we have, we have the word to go back to. Um, you've heard the expression, the word of God, it's the final court of arbitration. That's where we take uh, these questions to. And well, what, is, what does the, the Bible have to say about that? And, and does it really say that? We search those things, and it's important. Uh, and so um, we, we find in, in tonight's text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the apostle Paul, uh, who was the, the planter of this church with some help from Silas and, and, and Timothy, um, but the planter of this church in a, a pretty major Greek city, Thessalonica, uh, had to do that. He had to go back to the word for some clarification for them. He didn't need the clarification, but the church did, a young church. They needed some clarification. Uh, and so the apostle, Paul, uh, is going to clear up some, conf- some confusion on things like the rapture, the gathering of, of God's people, or snatching away, as, as it's referred to as well, uh, believers. Uh, he has to clarify some confusion that the church had about that um, and, and help them, remind them, uh, as he'll say, you know, I taught you these things when I was with you, which was less than a year prior to the writing of this, but I, I taught you these things, and I taught you how the gathering has to take place prior to the tribulation. Um, and, and he'll explain that, that the rapture is part of, it's, it's an aspect of his second coming, Jesus' second coming. Uh, but it's distinct. And uh, that, that's something that's important for us to, to remember, too. This is not some uh, you know, modern interpretation. This is, this is something that, that the scriptures themselves have laid out that there's these two aspects of the coming of Jesus. Uh, there's that aspect, and you see it in, in Matthew 24. Uh, we'll make reference to it again later. But in Matthew 24, uh, as it relates to the, to, to the, the second coming of, of Jesus Christ, um, there's reference to a, a time when it's kind of business as usual. You know, everything's just going on. People are buying and selling and everything's just going great. Uh, and then there's also reference to uh, it's like all hell breaks loose in, in a very literal sense. Uh, and so it's two very distinct um, atmospheres and settings and backgrounds, but both related to the, the return uh, of Jesus. Um, and, and so... As we study that, we find out that the rapture, uh, the, the gathering, the snatching away uh, of the church, uh, happens at a time when it's, it's kind of business as, as usual, right? Uh, Jesus referred to it as like in the days of Noah. You know, everyone's just kind of doing their thing and everything seems to be, superficially, uh, just fine. Uh, and then when Jesus returns to earth to reign as the King of kings and Lord of lords, it happens uh, at a time where the setting is, the background is devastating. It's just tribulation in the greatest sense uh, of, of the word. Trib- as Jesus said, it's tribulation like man has never seen before. So it's, it, it's, it won't be in that, in that seven years tribulation, when he comes back at the end of it, it won't be like, yeah, they, you know, that, that time was kind of, kind of reminds me of, you know, back in, you know, in, in, uh, with the, the COVID-19, it reminds me of the depression, it reminds me. No, it, it'll be like nothing people have ever seen before. So very distinct, right, in, in those two backgrounds, uh, in, in those two descriptions. And so those two aspects um, that I mentioned, business as usual and all hell breaking loose, you see that in, in, in many places in Scripture. You see the, you know, just the speaking of the, the imminent surprise of, of Jesus snatching his church away. You don't know when it is. Nobody knows the day or hour. It could happen at any time. There's, it's, it's imminent. And, and, and so it could happen at any time, and there's not, there's not any, um, any activity. We've talked about this before, but no activity, no event that has to happen prior to that happening. Um, and so we have that, that imminent surprise. And then we also see that the aspect of his return when he comes to reign here on the earth, 
uh, that there's, there's a lot of detail of what that'll look like and what'll take place prior to that. That's not a contradiction. It's not like, well, here it's supposed to be a surprise. You don't know anything that could happen prior to that, and here everything's laid out. Well, those are the, the two, the two uh, distinct aspects of, of the second coming of Jesus. So the, the gathering of the church and then all of us coming back down to earth with Jesus to, to reign with him. So that's got a lot of detail, right? In, in terms of, you know, uh, three and a half years uh, into the tribulation, a very specific event will take place in Jerusalem, which Paul will talk about, and we'll get to that in, in a moment. So the believers, again, background here, um, concerned believers. Um, they're believers that are a little troubled, a little shaken in mind, we'll see, uh, in verse 1. And so... Because they were shaken and troubled, uh, thinking, and here's why, thinking that the rapture had, had passed and the tribulation had begun, that would be troubling, right? That, that we missed it, and it's, it's begun, it's happening. Um, it, it, it'd shake you up, it would trouble you, and it's like, oh, it, it, it's, I, it's, Paul talked about the craziness of it, and, and, and that, that wouldn't happen to us. He even said in the first letter that God hasn't appointed us to his wrath, so, you know, what's going on? And, um, and, and so you, you've got that going on with these folks. And then you also have the, the fact that when Paul left um, Thessalonica, less than a year prior to the writing of this, it, it wasn't like everything was just um, peaceful in, in, that, in that large city. Um, th- there was a lot of uh, angry, um, uh, very... Uh, very livid, very, very upset, violently upset, uh, opposers, opposition to the gospel and to what Paul wa- was, was sharing and what was going on. That was persecution. Uh, Paul had to basically, he had to, he had to slip out of town. It, it, was, it was that intense. And so that hasn't stopped, that persecution of the Christians in, in, this, uh, in this city. So we read verse 1. And two, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though, as if the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, as some translations say, same thing, uh, had come. We don't want you to be troubled by this. And so Paul is saying that it, it, it doesn't matter the supposed official source. If it contradicts Scripture, if it doesn't line up with this, it, you know, if somebody says, well, the Holy Spirit spoke to me of this, and that's why he says, you know, even if it's by Spirit, uh, or somebody says, you know, we, we have the words of a, of a, of a new preacher, nah, it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, we got an official epistle from the apostles in Jerusalem. Mm, no, that, that's, that's not the real deal. And so, again, that's why Paul says there uh, in verse 2 that you should be shaken by this whether, wherever it came from. You know, again, if it were a letter, a letter as if it was a letter from, from, uh, from the apostles. The bottom line is that if you were told that the day of the Lord has begun, it's a lie. It's not true, church. So why would he say that? I, I think to best answer that, we need to first define what is the day of the Lord. So what is the day of the Lord? It's referred to all over Scripture. You see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. Um, it's, it's written in many places, talking about different aspects of it for obvious reasons, and I'll tell you why. Because there's a lot to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is, is the day God begins to, to intervene with His final plan for the earth. And when that starts, when that kicks off, uh, when he intervenes into the affairs of man, it begins the day of the Lord. That, that's what we speak of there. So what is part of that day? Well, the, the day it kicks off is, is the gathering, the rapture of the church. And then next is the allowing, the Lord allowing the Antichrist to surface, to be revealed, if you will. Uh, it's, the Lord will keep that from happening before it should happen. Uh, and that, of course, is followed immediately by seven years of, of tribulation, the last three and a half of which are, are horrendous. The first three and a half are pretty gnarly. The last three and a half, all the more. And then the return and reign of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, and so that reign, as we know, is, is a reign of a thousand years. We, we call it the, the millennial, or the millennium, rather. It's a millennial period, a thousand-year period. We call it the millennium just, just to, to shorten that, that description. Uh, that is the reign of Christ. So all of that encompasses the day of the Lord, right? The, the day God begins to intervene in, in the affairs of man as they've just gone on uh, in light of the fall and, and for God pouring out his, 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 his wrath on an unbelieving world that hasn't received the payment um, of, of the wrath that Jesus took upon himself. So Paul says again that if, if somebody tells you that this is, is started, uh, it's a lie. Uh, it's deception. And so in verse 3, he says, let no one deceive you. Because that would be deception if they were to say otherwise. Let no one deceive you uh, by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple and shows himself that he is God, or, or so he, he wants people to believe. So Paul says, the Apostle Paul says that, just almost by way of reminder to the church, hey, there's things that have to happen, and so he's going to go over them with them in, in sequence. So we'll look at that in a little more detail. So he said there in verse 3, first, uh, what has to take place, that day is not going to come, that it's not going to begin uh, unless the, the falling away, as our new King James says, the, the falling away comes first. That, that's going to happen. So I don't want to bog down on this too much, um, and we'll take a few minutes on this. I would invite you, if, you, if you, this is like a, a pet topic of yours and you want to discuss it more, please feel free to email me. We can enter a, a, in an email dialogue it's alan, A-L-Y-N, at refugefamily.com. Um, but the word that is used there in, in the original language that, that Paul transcribed this as, as led by the Holy Spirit is, is the word apostasia. And so that word, um, the word apostasia, is, is the root word of, of the word that we in modern times called apostasy. So if, if you ever looked in a dictionary um, online or hard copy, and, and you'll see the etymology of a word. What's the origin of it, right? Some words are, have a Greek origin, some have a Latin origin, and, and it'll tell you what the root of that, kind of where we got that word. How did we get that English word? You know, and, and some of our words have a French origin, a Latin origin, a Greek origin. And, and so it's interesting, to, you know, to find out where, where they come from. But uh, sometimes we can do ourselves a disservice when we say, well, what does that word mean today? And, and just impose that upon what it, what it meant then, right? That, that's kind of a dangerous way to do it. We want to look at what it meant then um, to understand what it meant then. So we don't want to impose today's understanding, right? So uh, a word that we can get, an example that everybody knows is, is the, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's explosive power of the Holy Spirit. And so a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, that's the root word where we get our word dynamite, which, which it is, but... Um, you know, dynamite wasn't even a concept that you could relate to 2,000 years ago. So um, we just got to be careful when we, uh, we impose a modern-day understanding back on, on a previous time. And so apostasy, um, which is a real thing, and the Bible even talks about it, uh, is a departing of the faith, right? Uh, is a, is a, a leaving of the faith, and um, and and so you know that that's something that the Bible does talk about. But the the word here, that the word apostasia, it it just simply means departure. That that's what the word translates to. Now it is interpreted as falling away because that's what you do when you when you translate. You try to interpret a, 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 a like an English word, for example, for a, for a Greek word, and so it is. It is uh, translated as departure, but it's interpreted as falling away. So here, here's the question, and here's the reason I'm, I'm kind of, you may think, bogging down. It's really not bogging down. This is important. Um, but it, it, it brings the question to mind, are we talking about a departure from the earth, the church, 
departing from the earth? Are we talking about a departure from the faith of, of sound biblical teaching? And, and so that, that's the question. And, and by the way, that's a, that's a question that scholars um, and, and language scholars, biblical scholars, not just language scholars, but, but biblical scholars that are, are, uh, are, have masters and doctorates in, in, in linguistics, they've wrestled with it. Uh, with, with which could it be? And they've got, there's, there's schools of thought for both, and, and they both make a, a decent case, uh, having read a, a lot on, on their different points of view. Um, and so the idea of, of, you know, departure from the faith, you know, the falling away in that sense, um, it, maybe I should say departure, departing from the faith, because that's the actual translation of the word. Um, Paul warned of that. In, as a matter of fact, in his letter that he would write later to Timothy, um, who helped him plant this church. Timothy would later become a, a, a pastor and, and pastor of his own church, and Paul wrote him a couple letters, First and Second Timothy. You're familiar with those. They're right after these epistles in your Bible. And in that letter, and I believe it's the first letter, I should have written that down, but in, I think it's the first letter Paul wrote to Timothy, and, and it kind of warned him of this happening. Uh, and and, and so people that, that go down that road of departing from sound biblical teaching and from the faith, Paul said, you know, that's going to happen um, in, in, in the last days. And he says, it's happening now. Don't, don't pour time into those people, right? Don't have anything to do with them. So it, it's, you know, the la- last days, that, that in itself is an interesting phrase, right? The last days, because what are the last days? Were, were there the days leading up to the day of the Lord. So if the day of the Lord could be kicked off by the rapture, it, it could have happened at any time. And so Paul could always write to uh, the churches and talk about these things that, you know, they can happen. Uh, and they even happened then. It was happening in, in Paul's day, this kind of departing from the sound faith. And, and you think, gosh, that's pretty quick. I mean, it's only, you know, the faith in, of, in, in Christ as, as Messiah, um, in the writing of this you know, 20 some odd years, right? But it was already happening. And so Paul, you know, had to instruct Timothy in that regard. So, um, yeah, that, that's happening. But here we're, t- we're talking about, and it, and it could be that, but he says something has to happen um, that kicks off the, 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 the day of the Lord. And um, he says it's, it's the departure um, that, that will happen. The falling away against, it says there, or the, think of it as the departure comes first. So um, that definite article, the, not just any old falling away, but a specific one, could we be talking about that just really happening to a, a, a level like never before, um, right before the day of the Lord kicks off? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I suppose we, we could. Uh, we certainly see signs of that today, right? When you think about how many of our mainline denominations, uh, Roman Catholic, um, Greek Orthodox, Protestant denominations, and, and you look at some of, their, um, some of their writings and beliefs now, and you think, my goodness, that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's certainly not scriptural. And matter of fact, there's anti-scripture in a lot of places. And you think, wow. That, that's amazing. That's a departure from the sound faith, uh, and it has increased um, as far as we can see, uh, for sure. But also, you can make a, a case for the departure has to take place. The departure of the church that that has to take place. Uh, it's, it's the first thing that's going to happen. So both are worthy of saying the the departure, the departure of the faith, and the departure uh, of the church. Um, and as you and I have have found over years of studying together, when you have a case like this where both are true, both can be supported um, scripturally, and, and I know there's, there's, there's two schools of thought in that, but both are, are, are solid um, scholarship. And, and typically when you have that, it means both are probably the case. So instead of just saying, nope, it's definitely the departure of the church, or nope, it's definitely the departing from the, the faith as, as we know it, um, we, don't have to, we don't have to do that. Uh, both certainly are, are applicable, uh, and both line up with Scripture in, in other places of Scripture. So we don't rest it just on this, right? That, that could be dangerous sometimes when you just hang your hat on one hook, so to speak. 
So we have that. So that's got to happen first, the departure, whether it's the departure of the church uh, or the departure of, 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 of sound biblical faith. So that happens first. Uh, the departure comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. <laughs> Think about the, if you were described as this, oh, you're, you're the one that opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, I am God. And so that comes next. But it's, it's, it's not that he just is, is born at that point in time. He's revealed at that point in time, right? That's the key there, as it says in the verse there. He's revealed at that time. So he's been there, um, but he's revealed at that time. This man of sin, this son of perdition is unveiled. Uh, Daniel, uh, the, the, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament he speaks much of, of this individual that will come uh, in the day of the Lord. Uh, speaks of him as a wicked ruler, as, as a prince, a leader, a monarch, a, a progeny of the destroyer is the idea. They're son of perdition, uh, perdition being d- destruction, and, and Satan being referred to in Revelation as the destroyer. He's the progeny somehow of, of the destroyer. He's a son of perdition. Uh, we know him also as the Antichrist, Right? So anti in, in, in both senses of that word as well. Uh, anti meaning uh, in place of, anti meaning against. He's both. Uh, because he, he wants to be worshipped like God. Uh, he wants to show himself that he is God and, and, and is in place of, of what others may think of who God is. No, I, I am God in place of God. But also against, for sure, right? I mean, how could you, <laughs> you, you couldn't say, hey, worship me and, and be for God uh, and and. and, and and be a friend of God. You'd have to be an enemy of God against God. So Daniel prophesied, uh, and by the way, when Daniel prophesied the the amazing things that he did uh, in um, what we know as as the book of Daniel, uh, this was written five centuries before Christ uh, was born, and um, so amazing detail in there. But as he spoke of, of this man, Jesus also did too. Jesus in Matthew 24 spoke of him. John, uh, the apostle, did in Revelation. And, and Revelation 13 really stands out to me. Um, and the early church as well wrote of this man, the son of perdition. Um, and, and the reason I say that, because some people later in the church, in, in later in church history said, well, you know, maybe it's not a man. Maybe it's, 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 it's a system. And and the scripture is pretty clear when you look at all the different places, uh, as I mentioned, Revelation 13, Matthew 24, Daniel 9 and 11 and such. And so this man demands that he be worshipped in the temple, uh, in the temple. Uh, we know that as, uh, by a phrase, the abomination, something that's just abominable, of desolation, desolating the temple of God in Jerusalem, which I know some of you are saying, hey, there is no temple in Jerusalem right now. Uh, and, there, and there was when Jesus spoke of it, and there was when Paul wrote it. It hadn't been destroyed yet when he was writing this. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but he wants to be worshipped in place of God the Son. Uh, and so the Antichrist wants to be worshipped there in, in the temple. So um, this, this um, perhaps it certainly would bring to mind the, 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 the possible catalyst for him to be received by um, Jews as the Messiah. He's going to be, be received by the world ultimately as a leader. But how, how is the, the, the nation of Israel? How would they receive such a, a person in, in this role? Um, and, and certainly somebody that can help facilitate them having a temple again. Um, <laughs> that guy would be a hero, right? And he would be a hero to the world if he could pull that off with not starting a world war. Uh, with, with the Arab nations, right, in the Muslim world. It's like, how, how could you do that? I mean, that, he'd be the greatest politician of all times if you can pull that off. And, um, and he will be. He'll be the greatest politician of all times because he, he will pull it off. So the, the temple that we speak of here where he would, he would do this abomination, again, it's there in verse 4, sits as God in the temple of God. No temple there now. And, and so 
perhaps in your mind you're thinking, but I thought you said, you know, when Jesus raptures the church, there's no event has to take place, nothing. That, that's true. That's true. So there doesn't have to be a temple for the rapture of the church. There just has to be a temple by three and a half years into the tribulation, right? So Daniel says that this man will make some kind of treaty contract, some kind of accord That'll be a seven-year accord, and thus the seven years of tribulation, thus the, the final week of Daniel. Um, but in the middle of that, three and a half years into it, that's when he does this. So some, it could just be you know, during that three and a half years that he pulls this off. Uh, maybe in the beginning, he you know, negotiates, and construction begins. Any of you that have been to Israel, or you don't even have to have been to Israel, you've heard about the Temple Institute that has all the implements and everything ready to go. So should the day ever happen that they get a temple, man, they're ready to rock and roll. They got, they got all the, the stuff that they, they need in terms of the implements to carry out the sacrifices and all. But in the middle of this seven-year period, in three and a half years, this leader is going to say, hey, <laughs> enough with all the sacrificial stuff to your God, I'm God, okay? Worship me. And it'll just be an abomination, as the scripture says. So where, how could this happen? If, for you and me, we, we say that, right? In, in, in 2020, it's like, how could it happen? You've read the accounts. You don't have to, as I said, have been to Israel to know these things. That um, you know, if, a, if a Jewish rabbi goes up into the Temple Mount, um, which is, is considered a very holy site for the Muslim world, the al Aska Mosque there, which is an active mosque, and then the famous Dome of the Rock Mosque, which is more like a, a monument there, all up there in the Temple Mount where the temple, uh, the Jewish temple used to reside, uh, of course, torn down in 70 AD. Um, but if a rabbi goes up there just to pray, I mean, it, it gets pretty crazy up there. You think you've got a little mini riot going um, and it can, get, it can get pretty heated up there. So you think, that's one guy uh, you know, going up there to, to pray. Um, how in the world could they build uh, a, a temple up there? And, and it is like that. And it's not just for, for, for a Jewish rabbi. It, when we go in our groups there, I mean, there's a lot of strict rules we have to apply when we're up in the Temple Mount. Um, so um, just the idea that, that the Jews could have a temple there uh, you'd say, well, where, where's it going to go? Because there's no way those mosques are going down, the Dome of the Rock and, and then the al Aska Mosque. Uh, those aren't going anywhere. Not a problem. Um, because they're, on the other side of the, the, the Dome of the Rock, just north of it, is a large, expansive courtyard area. I mean, it's a big, the Temple Mount is a, is a real big area. Um, but just north of the Dome of the Rock is a very expansive area area it's a, it's a huge area um and in this huge expansive area is this tiny little uh, looks like a little gazebo it's made with stone um with a rounded top and it looks like a, a little gazebo it looks like somebody you know might have built it for a little jacuzzi in their their backyard in the middle east or something and it's just sitting there like out in the open it's it's strange uh, this 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 little um little structure but it's known as the, 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 the Dome of the Tablets, or in some uh, places we refer to it as the Dome of the Spirits. But the Dome of the Tablets, where there's actual bedrock of the uh, original temple there. Um, and there are some scholars that say that's where the Holy of Holies actually was, and the direction, if you look from there and then look east, uh, lines up with Eastern Gate, and there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of evidence and scholarship would say that that's where the temple would go anyway. Um, you tie that in with where in Revelation it says, don't worry about measuring the, the court of the Gentiles for the, the, this temple. And all that to say, it could be done, but it's going to take a master politician. We're reading about him right here. He's, he's the master politician. But he is restrained. And so... Verse 5 says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, so less than a year prior, Paul there, three weeks, probably just pouring into these folks day after day during that time, but don't you remember that when I was still with you, I, I told you these things. He's saying, hey, remember, <laughs> we talked about this. And that's why it's good to repeat stuff, right? So we told you these things. And... Um, and now you know, verse 6, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Uh, and so he's saying, hey, 
we talked about this. There's, this, there's a restraint that keeps this from happening, uh, from keeping the Antichrist being revealed, the son of perdition, uh, until a certain time. And, and so the Lord does that, right? Only the Lord has, has the power to do that, to restrain something from, from happening. I, the, the Apostle John, excuse me, too many peanut butter cookies, Mike, <clears throat> but they're good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> see, just the thought of peanut butter cookies, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, oh, I know. The Apostle John, he talks about the spirit of Antichrist. I mean, that, 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 that kind of attitude, and even in, in, the, in the, the, the purest sense of the word spirit, uh, it, that, that's something that's, that's been around um, and is around, that spirit of Antichrist. I want to be in place of that. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if in, in, the, in the realm of the forces of darkness, there, there's been many that, that Satan would have liked to, to put in this place, you know, whether it had been, you know, a, a Hitler in, in modern times or a Caligula, uh, one of the Roman emperors. Matter of fact, he, he was one that, that did want to have his image put in the temple and died before he could pull that off, but... Um, anyway, that, that, that spirit of Antichrist and lawlessness, right, of, of lawlessness, um, as the Scripture um, describes there, for the mystery of lawlessness, verse 7, is already at work. All, all this is, is already at work. It always has been um, forces of darkness against uh, the Lord. And, and the, the, uh, the, the man of sin, the Antichrist, the center of perdition, will be a man of lawlessness, and, and yet in the sense of not, not of without civil law, because he has to, has to rule, and you have to rule with law, um, but without God's moral law. There's the difference, right? Lawlessness in the sense of God's moral law. And so he's being restrained until this specific time, till the day of the Lord, the um, uh, departure first, uh, and then the revealing of, of who he is at this specific time. And so the Holy Spirit... Uh, of God is restraining. So here's the question. Does, is, is God doing that? Is the Holy Spirit restraining by way of the presence of the church, right? Because the Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible says, uh, resides in, in the church in, in the plural sense. Uh, well, Paul, the apostle says, you individually, you that are a believer, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, but the church at large, you, plural, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit resides in us, right? Jesus said uh, before he uh, died on the cross and, and, and then rose and went to heaven, he said, I'm going to send you another comforter and he's always going to be with you. Uh, and so in, in that sense, you know, it, th- that could be, the Holy Spirit could be restraining by way of, of the, the, the presence of the church. Um, is that definitely what's being said here? I, I, I'm, I, I, don't, I think so, but I, I wouldn't say that you could um, just hang your hat solely on, on, on this as that being the case. Um, some pros and cons with the Greek language on that. But the restraining element is the Lord, and, it, and that's done. It can be done with or without us, right? It's not like God, man, I really need the church to do this. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a restraining of the Holy Spirit. So whether it's done with us or without us, um, it, it's more just a, an interesting point to discuss. Uh, but the fact is, the, uh, this revealing of who He is is uh, restrained by the Lord. The Lord is the one that does that. Uh, so when you read on in verse 7, uh, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Until he is taken out of the way. So we could look at that and say, you know, that really fits with the church being uh, departing, the church being snatched away, the church being gathered, the church being raptured, whatever phrase or term you want to use there. It certainly could fit with that, right? Um, As Jesus said, I'm always with you. The Holy Spirit is always with you, but he's not limited to you, right? So that's important to make that distinction. Make sure you get that. So the Holy Spirit definitely is in you, um, and he works through you. He works through me, um, but he's not limited to me or to you. It's not like, "Ah, you know, the Holy Spirit, man, (laughs) if if there's not a believer, he can't work. Well, that's not true. He's God. It's not limited. Um, so, definitely, he's always with us, but he's not limited to us. So, 
um, you know, we, we, even when the church is, 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 uh, is, is snatched away, when the departure of the church takes place, during that tribulation period, people are going to get saved. You read the book of Revelation, and, and it's, it's very clear people get, get saved. There's the saving, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit, by the way. It, the Holy Spirit is the one that, 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 that can draw a, a man or woman to that place. Um, so that saving work of the Holy Spirit is going to take place during the tribulation. Um, and, and yet there seems to be a, a restraining work here. Um, and, and the text could, could def- support that, um, that he, when he is taken out of the way. So um, certainly, certainly very, very possible that that's what's being spoken of here. Uh, but but the, again, the fact is that the Holy Spirit is the one that restrains this revealing uh, till um, after the church is taken up and the day of the Lord begins. Verse 8 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed to that point, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. I like that. It's, that there, there's seven years right there, just in, in one verse, in verse 8. So the lawless one, he'll be revealed after that, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a good preface to what Paul's going to talk about in the next couple of verses. Because, you know, you talk about some things about this, this leader, the son of perdition, you go, whoa, really, he's got that kind of power? He's got the charisma to pull some of this stuff up. He's got that kind of power too. Well, he's the son of perdition. He's the progeny of, of Satan. So, yeah. Um, but I, I, it's just one of those one of those texts where the Bible is um, is just it's just so casual and so subtle. Yeah, you know, the lawless one, this antichrist, this this monster, if you will. But you know, when Jesus comes back, he'll consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. Boom, done, gone. Um, and so there again, seven years covered real quickly. But, um, uh, you know, Paul is, is also, as he is sharing these things with the church, he's also reminding them, saying, hey, none of this stuff has happened, you guys, okay? So the day of the Lord definitely hasn't begun, because none of this is, is taking place. Um, and, of course, things that are precursors, the, 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 the rapture being uh, the first there. So more on the Antichrist. Verse uh, 9, let's look at verse 9. So the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Satan will be working through him, right? Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. That's how people are saved. They just receive the love of the truth. But those that have it are, are those who are on the earth at this time. And some will get saved, but that, that's, that's who the earth is populated at this time with. And this leader, this son of perdition, this, this prince, uh, this world ruler, um, will have powers signs and lying wonders so again imagine you know imagine somebody that that's a charismatic leader that that could could pull together um uh, the 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 jew and the muslim to agree to having a temple up in the temple mount We've seen in our lifetime some world leaders that you know attempt to do that, and it's like, yeah, okay, we'll meet not the temple, but just to even have some kind of peace accord. And um, you don't walk away thinking, "Wow, that was amazing." You walk away thinking, uh, "That ain't gonna last. That's not real." Um, but a, charis- a charismatic leader that can do that, and and on top of that, has supernatural powers. That that's that's interesting. So you may say, well, how could that be? I mean, only God has supernatural powers. And to that, I would say there, there's no comparison in, 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 in the powers of the force of darkness and, and the Lord. And, and forgive me if I'm belaboring the obvious, but for some, there, there is that concern. They're thinking, oh, this, they're like equal, equal powers. You know, it's like the, the dark side and the force. 
Um, it's, no, it's, it's not like that. I mean, that's, that's a great picture of good versus evil and all that, and, and, and that's fun, and I, I enjoy that, but that's not a picture of, of, of the power of, of the living God and the power of a created fallen angel um, who, in his pride, wants to be, I want to be worshipped like God. Um, so what kind of powers and how real are they? Some of the examples we get in Scripture which is where we would want to look. A pharaoh's um, priest in Exodus would be a good example of that. Um, and, and even with those, very limited. But you remember, uh, if you've read in Exodus, when Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, and you know, he has his, his, his hiking stick and, um, and throws it down and it turns into a snake. And so Pharaoh's priest, well, they, they do that. They, they take a a snake and make them into a, a walking stick, you know, or at least appear to that, you know, so whether it's snake charming or, or whatever, or just, you know, uh, an illusion, I don't know, but they, they do it, okay, that, that we know, scripture tells us that. Um, when you know, Moses uh, takes a staff and, and his walking stick and, and, and hits the Nile River, turns it to blood, and, and so they duplicate that by turning some water it, to make it look like blood so is it an illusion i don't know but they they have that ability to do that uh when there's the plague of frogs um which i always thought was comical the priests you know of pharaoh said well we can do that too and so they bring frogs which is like no 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 if you really got power guys get rid of these frogs but they summon these hordes of frogs to you know invade you know the capital city and surrounding areas and so how do they do that i, I don't know it's, it's some kind of power uh, that wouldn't be an illusion the other things could be an illusion but uh, i mean they're, they're frogs i mean so how did they summon them I, I don't know but it pretty much stopped there um, because as those those plagues and supernatural acts and miraculous acts of god through moses uh took place uh turning the sky dark and you know the hailstones and, and such at that point the priest you know said hey <laughs> we're out of here man this is way uh, beyond us, you know, with our little magic tricks and such. But, but, it, but that, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, and th- those are, you know, th- those are impressive. I mean, Pharaoh was impressed by it, and, and, and maybe even initially Moses might have, whoa, <laughs> look what that guy did. Um, but the reality is uh, it's just it's, um, cheap stuff, cheap tricks. But it, it works. People look at it and go, whoa, this, look at that, it's power. So this a man who espouses lawlessness um, is, uh, will be popular, right? And, and again, lawlessness in the sense of, of, of God's moral laws, um, freedom from that, freedom from the restrictions of that Judeo-Christian myth. I mean, my goodness, how archaic was that? <laughs> Good riddance to those people, right? I mean, that, that kind of stuff, that is just... That is so, um, uh, it's just so bigoted and it, it's so restrictive and, uh, and, and, and the, the limitations and, and, and all. And, and so that, that's the kind of thing we're talking about when we, we say this man of lawlessness um, will, will bring freedom uh, to folks. So it, it won't be an absence of religion. It'll be a religion of no holds barred. Uh, again, as I mentioned uh, moments ago, uh, we see many of, of, of denominations of Christianity have gone down this road, and it, it doesn't really look any different than the world's ways, other than it's, it's being espoused of in a church building with somebody with, with robes or a clerical collar. Um, and, and so um, it's appealing. People go to that because it's, it's appealing. It's like, man, I can go to church and I can, I can choose my own sexual behavior and it doesn't even matter. And, but I can still go, I can go to church. I can be a church going person. This is pretty cool. Um, and, and so it, it appeals to the flesh and, and, and Satan certainly is pretty good at, at, uh, at doing that. So who is duped by this? And, and we, we saw it already there in, in verse 10, but let's, let's read verse 10, uh, and at least the beginning of 11 uh, again. So, with all unrighteous deception uh, among those who perish, uh, because they didn't receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, 
For this reason of, of rejecting the way, the truth, and the life, for this reason, God will send them, them that, that have turned from the, the truth, um, uh, those that did not receive the love of the truth, he will send them strong delusion, still in verse 11, send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who didn't believe the truth. That, that's who would be condemned, just not, not believing the truth. It's not that they weren't good enough or this or that. They didn't believe the truth, but they had pleasure in the unrighteousness. They, they chose the unrighteousness. And so this, this, take it back to Exodus, it kind of reminds me of that as well. It reminds me uh, of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. And nobody tells me what to do and what I'm going to do with my slaves or my slaves. Say, let my people go. They're my people, not yours, Moses, or your gods. And, and so that hardened heart, that rejection of the truth, and, and multiple opportunities, right, for Pharaoh to turn, multiple opportunities. See, to the very end, people will have opportunities. Again, the Holy Spirit will be working during the tribulation. The church won't be there, but the Holy Spirit is still working. Um, and, and so uh, strong delusion will come to those that have gone down that path. So Paul has, has made his point. He's, he's clarified things to the church with this portion of the letter, reminding them of things he taught them in person earlier. Um, and, and it's providing the comfort that they needed. Uh, and, and I think the comfort that people need all the time. It's like, I got to hear this stuff again. I got to be reminded of this. It, it brings comfort. Um, and, and, and it brings understanding that the unbeliever um, can still believe. Um, and, and yet at the same time, I mean, you've got to... <laughs> we know people will, will, will turn to Christ somehow, some way during the tribulation. But for those that would think, well, I, I'll just wait till then. You've got to just, just logically think, my goodness, if, if, you can't, if you can't live for Jesus now, do you, is, do you really think it would be that easy to die for him then? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it just sounds, <laughs> sounds like a weak proposition to, to me. But the fact of the matter is that, that it'll happen. So it, 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 to some degree, we can take comfort in that because uh, I suspect we'll all will know people that have yet to receive Christ. They've yet to come to Jesus um, by the time we leave, whether we leave by death or leave by rapture, uh, but, but folks that perhaps we know that may end up during this, this period of the day of the Lord, and uh, our hearts would go out, thinking, oh my goodness, it's, just, it's, it's, it's too, too late for them. And so um, th- there is some comforting element knowing that that's, that's not true. Uh, and also, um, there's comforting uh, truth to the, to the fact that, as Paul said to them, and would say to us, that the day of the Lord hasn't begun, okay? So, um, you know, people say, oh, you missed the rapture, or that ain't going to happen. Uh, even if you didn't miss it, it's not happening. Um, Paul has reiterated and, and made his case rather thoroughly, um, for sure. So, there's comfort in that. And, and the fact that that day can't happen until, until we're home, until we're gathered, uh, until we're um, departed. Um, the, the, the divine judgment, if you will, that the tribulation is, that seven years of, of, of judgment on an unbelieving world, uh, it won't happen until uh, we're removed. Um, again, I mentioned it earlier, as Paul said in his first letter, uh, God's not appointed us to wrath. Uh, his wrath, right? Um, Jesus said you're going to have tribulation in the world. That's just the reality of living in a fallen world. But this is not a fallen world that will take place in, in the tribulation period. That's God doing this. When you read through Revelation, uh, after you go through the seven churches, and then you read about what transpires um, after these things of the church, um, that, that's God pouring out His, his wrath on, uh, on, on those that would not accept Jesus' payment of, of, of taking on that wrath. So... Until we're removed, that's not going to happen. It's, it's just like um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot. Uh, uh, you know, he had to be removed um, from uh, Sodom and Gomorrah before, for, before judgment came. Um, and it's interesting because you know, the Bible speaks of him, which anybody that's read the account of Lot and the kind of guy that he is, you always think, really? Righteous Lot? The Bible refers to him as righteous Lot in Hebrews. Um, it's Hebrews or James, but the, 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 just the description of Lot is righteous, like 
I, I, I read his story. That, that's not a righteous man. Um, but he was righteous because of his faith, um, his faith in, in, in the living God. Uh, and so the Lord made sure, um, just as the Lord had promised Abraham, no, I'll, uh, I'm not going to, I'll get him out of there. So uh, that's, that's comforting. And, and that's why, uh, as a matter of fact, I mentioned the, the first letter. If you remember when we were in chapter 4 of, of 1 Thessalonians, Paul said that we who are alive and, and remain up until this time when the, the day of the Lord is, is to begin, we'll be caught up together um, uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we'll always be with the Lord, right? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you and, and I'm going to take you to be with me uh, in the Gospel of John. And so Paul says, hey, we'll always be with the Lord. And then he, right after that he says, therefore, based on what I just said there, as he spoke to the church and all churches, all believers, he said, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Because those are comforting words. Those are very comforting words. Comfort one another with these words. Uh, and the words that he would say in the next breath there as well, that, that God has not appointed us uh, to wrath. Um, because Jesus took that wrath in our place. Um, which is a, a sobering thought. Um, comforted by the fact that we won't experience that, but sobering in that he, he did in, in a matter of speaking. So we'll stop there uh, with those comforting words, sobering but comforting words. And next week we will pick up uh, in verse 13 and go into uh, to chapter 3. Um, uh, is, no, actually, I think we'll, st- we'll just finish. We'll just finish that maybe, yeah, we'll finish that maybe a little into to 3. So let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the clarity of your word. Lord, thank you for repetition, for reiteration. Uh, Lord, I just pop in my head, I, I'm thinking about the Apostle Peter saying that, that we repeat these things, we remind you of these things because we need to be reminded. Um, and Lord, that makes me think of uh, even tomorrow's fireside chat, that they will have communion. And then a week from tomorrow, uh, we will have Good Friday service. And and we will do this in remembrance of your son. That we need to be reminded of, of the wrath he took upon himself uh, for us. Um, we do it in remembrance of him and, and what he did. Uh, and so, Lord, thank you for uh, making sure that these things were transcribed and transcribed accurately, Lord, so that we could not guess. We cannot say, well, I think, or he said, or... She believes, but, but what you say, Lord, that, that's where our comfort is and what you say. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us um, tonight, and um, see you next Thursday.